So I'm going to introduce Martin Allen and Diane Marshall, who are working with us all together, Diane from the SBA and, and ABBA and Martin from ABBA and the SBA. And um, no, just from ABBA, okay. And so I'm gonna hand over to Diane, who's gonna give a sort of overview of where we're going and what we're going. In case you haven't checked already, there's quite a lot of information on the ABBA website um, on what the theme of the exhibition is and all sorts of information about submitting work, sizing. There's another uh, Zoom talk about uh, presenting your artwork and sizing. So in this one, we're going to cover what types of plant you can actually submit. Um, based on the guidance from uh, the American Society of Botanical Arts, who is obviously organising the, the worldwide exhibition, uh, we're looking really at the uh, biodiversity and crop diversity of uh, a number of food and useful plants. So we're not just looking at food plants, we're looking at things like plants that are made used for textiles, um, you know, flax linen, for example, um, We've also got building, we've got wood, hazel, you know, for basket work and that type of thing. Plants used for energy, um, you know, oil crops and that type of thing, and also medicinal plants. That also includes, uh, so we've got plants, fungi and algae, so it covers the whole area. Um, we're really looking at the old varieties, so... Um, really plants that have been in cultivation for at least 50 years but as we were saying earlier that's only the 70s but uh, we're really looking for the old varieties uh, that have been around for a long time these are the sort of plants that provide the um, you know the genetic diversity and the disease resistance for crops because when you get these huge monoculture crops they can be wiped out by a very simple disease so they're keeping these old breeds alive and I think there is a lot more interest in old varieties of, of, of plants as well. So we're really looking at plants that have been associated with humans and mankind obviously for ABBA in the UK but just generally wherever you're from with humankind. Um, and we would say, for example, in Britain, we're talking about plants that are not necessarily originally native. So potatoes, tomatoes, that type of thing weren't originally from the UK. They were from South America. But if they've been grown here for a very long time, and we have some very old varieties of these, um, you could include those. But we're really looking at plants and varieties that are not widely grown. As an example, Granny Smith is a very popular apple variety that's been grown for many hundreds of years, I think 1850s or something, but it's widely available. So we would exclude that because it's not really a, a heritage crop that's grown in small quantities uh, that is not widely grown. Um, so I think you're going to have to do quite a bit of research unless you've got something in mind, you know, something that jumps out at you. Um, to do some research, Google and whatever. And we've provided some information on the ABBA website of websites that you can go to and have a look at for research and people that grow these. Um, we also, um, sorry, I'm diverting a little bit here. We also had a very interesting visit to the Q Center for Economic Botany that we're talking about, you know, if you're looking at something like hazel, you could maybe reach out to growers of the crop who use different varieties in basket and weaving or whatever. So again, researching Google, what if you if something you find something that takes your fancy, you can go down a rabbit hole researching it. Um, we're looking at plants that are, are going to be attractive as well that that feed to your particular style of work. So you know, we want an attractive painting really, but within that, there's so many varieties that you could actually cover. Um, so I think that's probably what I was going to say about this. I'll I'll pick up from that then. So oh, well, can I can I just butt oh. in first because you know how I butt in all the time. <laughs> what I wanted to do was just share my screen just so that people yeah. are aware of where on our website um, this is. So this is the uh, the home homepage of ABBA. Mm -hmm. There is the Botanical Art Worldwide little logo on the top. If you click that, that will take you on to this page, um, which will give you your exhibition oh. information pack, the exhibition about the, the information about the QE, uh, Q and A's about the BAWW, 
And also, if you're not, if you are an international organizer, you can use this link here to actually find out about your country's um, organizers and how to get in touch with them. This information pack is downloadable, printable, and it will tell you everything you need to know about the British BAWW. Okay, I shall leave you to investigate that at a later date, and I will stop the share. Okay. Yeah, so I was just going to to give some examples of things that, that I'd look at. So some some let's to to be a bit more specific on on some things that that um I was interested in, um, and I think also when you're thinking about uh, your painting, you're thinking about your choice of image and what you're going to do, then. Um, it's important to think in terms of the exhibition that that is going to come out of this. Um, the idea is that that the exhibition tells, um, if you like, uses your images to tell a story about the country. So the country being um, the United Kingdom, except Scotland, because Scotland are doing their own thing. And so the plants there, it's your way of, of using your choice of plant to tell a little bit about maybe it's the history of the UK or a story about the UK. So I'll give you some examples to sort of make that uh, clearer. So for example, if we're looking at peas, okay, so if you're going to grow peas, I'm from the north of England. So carlin peas, carlin peas are a, are, are a thing up here, okay? And so that's a good story because you're then telling about something like a regional um, uh, food product, if you like, what that makes and that sort of thing. Um, another thing as well that's a kind of a North of England thing is gooseberries. And there's a lot of different varieties of gooseberries uh, that you can find. And that's a really interesting um, uh, story as to why there's lots of different varieties and why that matters and things. Um, I also... Um, when we, we talked about apples and Granny Smith, I was quite interested in, in if you're looking at, for example, an apple and you're thinking about what apple tells a good story, then I was thinking, well, you know, if you've got an apple that you used to have to store in an apple store before it was ready to eat, you know, so it was, you, you, you picked it from the tree in, say, uh, September, October, you then have to store it in your apple store, and over the winter it gradually ripens in, in the apple store, and then it's ready to eat in, say, February, or it's ready to eat in March. That's a much better story than just doing an apple that you can just pick and eat straight away. Does, does that, that make sense? Oh, that's okay, nodding, I can see nodding. <laughs> Um, so some other ideas then that I was that, that I was just you know did a quick brainstorm and and, and um, thought about um, in terms of um, heritage crops. Uh, there's a lot of um, things in terms of if you're growing um, like a wheat crop or a, an oat crop. There's such a thing called a land race crop, and that's that's often. Um, uh, uh, a type of so you say you're growing oats and it's a land race oats then what it will be is that there's a collection of oats that have slightly different genetic properties so if you get a very sunny year some of those oats will do well in the sunny year if you get a very wet year some of them will do really well in the wet year but what you won't get is a super duper massive um crop every year but you will get a reliable crop no matter what the weather and so that's an interesting story, being able to grow something that you will always get a good crop, not an amazing crop, but it won't fail. And that was really important in the past that you didn't want your crop to fail because then you're hungry, you know, really hungry or dead. Um, so other things as well, building, I thought, if we're going to talk about buildings, then um, those of you who know things about buildings, if you if you look at, um, uh, um, I think of a phrase now and I can't see it in my notes. Uh, crook beamed buildings, crook beamed buildings, crook beamed buildings use crooked um, or bent bits of timber. Okay, and so you can see if you look at your historic um, 
barns and things like that. They had these crook bean buildings. And they were really good because they used, uh, the, you were able to harvest bits of timber that wasn't straight. So you could go and select bits. But that's a better story uh, to talk about it from a, a crook bean building than just saying, oh, well, you know, we used to grow Scots pine and it's a really straight trunk and you can build things from it. You know, it's a better story. Same with hazel. You can do wattle and daub from hazel. Hazel's got lots of things. Another thing that you might think in terms of trees, small leaved lime. So small leaved lime, they used to use the inner bits. They used to strip the bark off and the inner bit of the bark or the bast they used to use for making ropes. And before we had plastic ropes and before we'd exploited the rest of the world, it was quite difficult to get a decent rope. And that was a really expensive rope and worthwhile. So that's a thing. Um, there are surprising things like bracken. So those of you who know bracken, it's generally thought as a weed, as a pest of upland areas. But in the med medieval period, it was very good for bedding. And there's some document it did, in, it used to grow on medieval grazing moors that, that parishes used to have. And there are some good documented things of um, parishes um, not quite fighting, but having almost fisticuffs over whose bracken it is that it should be collected. That's a, that turns a weed into an interesting cultural historical story and tells you that it was useful in the past. So that's a good uh, story. Um, into wildflowers, things like butterbur. Butterbur has big leaves that they used to wrap butter in to keep the butter clean. Um, and there's, there's other interesting stories associated with butterbur comes in male and female plants. So that's a good story as to why and where they are, where they are. Uh, uh, Lords and ladies or cuckoo pint, they used to use the starch tubers of those to take the starch out to starch uh, ruffs or collars. They used to wreck people, uh, usually ladies' hands. Uh, that when they had to do it, but they, they did it. Um, and then another good story I thought was rose hips. So rose hips collected from hedgerows in World War II to make rose hip syrup uh, because we were short of vitamin uh, C. A modern version, if you like, of thinking of uh, rose hips is, uh, those of you who know it, C. buckthorn. C. buckthorn has little tiny orange berries against the gray leaf uh which is visually obviously as a, as a painter quite exciting um and that also is a high vitamin c so you can see from what i've um oh i did a fungus as well so fungus um if anyone knows any fungi if you know ash trees and you're able to look at ash trees then um king alfred's cake it's a really easy fungus to know because uh, King Alfred burnt the cakes. And so effectively this fungus looks like little tiny uh, burnt buns stuck on the outside of a, of a tree trunk. Um, and that's really good because that, that was used as tinder for, for fire. So you could, you could light it and you could carry it and you could move fire from one place to another. It's a different story, it's using a different things. And then we also, if you're in Wales, lava bread, which is seaweed, you know, that sort of thing. So you can see from what I've chatted about, that stories from quite a wide range of stuff. Go on, Elaine. We've got a question. So when oh, you're no. finished. No, 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 I'm, I'm just saying that that's, there's a okay. wide and, range of things. And for those of you, use. I think that um, Carmen might have had her thumb up, did you? No, okay, so if you have got a question, if you can type it, that would be really helpful. So Alexandra asks, could you recommend some books about heritage crops? It would be more, that would be more reliable than Google. Um, some of the links that we've put up on um, the BAWW site, Mm -hmm. uh, for the British, those have actually been recommended by scientists. Um, so they're pretty reliable. Um, Mark Nesbitt at the Centre for Economic Botany recommended, but I'll ask whether Diane or 
Martin could suggest actual books. I think it's probably quite a difficult one. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of them are quite dense scientific publications when I've had a look. Um, there are a couple on the website, Abe Books, which does sort of old secondhand books. Um, and some of them are, are quite interesting, but I've just seen uh, another one here on, actually on eBay, Heritage Vegetables, The Gardener's Guide to Cultivating Diversity, which is £12. So the, the, I think the thing is, I suppose it depends what type of plants you want to do. I think it's also worth looking, see if you, what your library's got, and also looking at things like heritage crafts, because as, as Martin mentioned, right. Hazel, um, I'm looking at maybe doing something like um, flax, which is used for linen. Um, so it could be that gives you some ideas as well. Um, but without actually having a look at some of these books myself, I wouldn't want you to go and spend a lot on a book that is actually very boring and scientific and not really much help at all for our purposes. I think to look but we'll have a look. Yeah, to look on the, the internet, um, the uh, Garden Organic, the charity, on their website, they have what they call the Heritage Seed Library. And that lists um, a lot of, um, th these are uh, uh, varieties that they that, um, are often grown and collected the seed by amateurs and then spread out to, to other amateurs. Mm -hmm. And that has an interesting um, range of uh, varieties and older varieties, uh, including things like purple potted peas and, uh, and things like that, which are quite visually um, uh, interesting. Um, we've had another, well, um, a direct question. Um, great ideas, Martin, thanks. Julia T says, it may say on the website, but actually no, it doesn't. How are we going to monitor repeats? Or is that not an issue? Well, what do you mean by repeats? Repeat people doing the same thing. Um, now, it, it's when we did the first BAWW, it was slightly easier because we got people to sign up for specific wildflowers. For this one, it's a really, it's a very wide ranging, well, diverse um, topic. Therefore, we may get two of the same, but I think we're more likely to get a great diversity. So it's not really a problem if two people do the same thing. It's about their story and how they present it. Um, Martin, I, do you want right, So yeah, in terms, um, of that, in terms of what I would think of that is, um, this is always an issue for any artist when you're putting work into a public exhibition, which is how do I make my art different from everyone else's, okay? Because that's what you're going to look to do. Um, and when it's a when it's an exhibition where there is some sort of uh, juried element, so that they're, they're choosing, then you've also got to think about okay, whoever the jury is, what are they going to be thinking? Are they going to be looking, for example, to be doing their whole exhibition so they all look pretty much the same? No, they're not. They're going to want a fairly broad uh, range, visual range, and choice of plant range or fungi or whatever range to make a really interesting exhibition for people to look at you know to represent so when it comes to the skills that you need in terms of uh, as an artist it's not just your drawing skills it's not just your um uh you know, coloring in skills whatever it's it's the thinking that goes behind what you're choosing to paint or to, 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 to depict. And then you've also got to think about, well, okay, if I'm going to choose this plant, then how am I going to show it so that it best, um, it best does something that I'm comfortable with artistically as an artist, so it kind of represents the way that I generally paint or I generally draw or I generally show plants, but also that it's going to be um, sufficiently interesting or sufficiently whatever to catch the judge's eye or to, to, to show up well on the wall. This is back to the mystical wall appeal that Shirley Sherwood uh, often uh, talks about, you know, and how does that work? In terms of duplicating um, plants, uh, 
I would be fine on, uh, I think, seeing a duplicated plant as long as they're shown differently. You know, you can have, I think it, in terms of um, uh, an exhibition, it's quite exciting as an artist to go and look around an exhibition and see the same plant, but with two completely different contrasting visions from two different artists. That's quite exciting. That's quite um, uh, enlivening and interesting. So I would be fine about that. I don't think, and this is the difficult bit, I don't think if two paintings or two images of the same plant came and turned up and they were pretty similar, they're not going to both go in, are they? Because well, we don't want know. It depends. No, if they're, if they're too similar. If, if, they looked uh, as, if they looked the same, but how likely is that? No, it's not at all, to be honest, to be fair. Mm -hmm. Because we, one of the things that we all worry about is, is making our um, art unique and how do we make it that it's, that it's our art. But to be, to be quite frank, it's very difficult not to make your art unique. You know, you have to work really hard because the way that you think, the way that you're producing, the way that you're drawing, all those sorts of things come together to produce your image uh, and what have you. So The other thing when you're painting it, um, Diane, I might hand over and see if, if you agree with this. The one thing you are going to show is why or how, in terms of what it looks like, your plant is different from maybe, say it's a strawberry, how it's different from a lot of commercially grown strawberries. What makes yours an interesting variety? Why is that a good variety? I mean, taste, obviously, you can't really show, but, you know. I, well, can you? With the strawberry? Can you show a bit bit now to that? <laughs> Do you know? And does that make you think, oh, I bet that tasted good? Well, with the mouse. <laughs> you know, and if it looks suitably yeah. juicy. So, you know, these these are the things I think that are... I suppose it could, be, uh, it could be a bit more light-hearted. I, I, there's no reason why not to be. Oh, I suppose not. You oh. know, and a, a, a bit of joy doesn't go... <laughs> Nice. Well, yes, Diane, go on. Well, I was going to say, and we do have as part of the um, submission, you can write a hundred word piece about it. So that will also illuminate your your story of your picture. hundred words isn't very long, but you could actually explain why that plant is so special and what drew you to it and what why it contributes to the heritage of our, our crops and plants. Um, and I think that might be quite interesting. Um, but I think sort of showing you know that like for example if you've got a, a, an old heritage apple like um oh what are those ones that are uh, uh, russets for example mm. they're, they're, you're wanting to show that skin aren't you yeah they get some russets. lovely variety and texture from it that you don't really get from an apple you know that you buy with a shiny yes skin yeah all waxed and shiny yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so you're wanting to be able, as you say, you're wanting to be able to show that. I'm thinking, for example, of, um, if, you, if you're thinking of, say, um, for example, there was a picture of, where did we see it? Was it something that someone in America showed us? But there was an image where um, someone had done a crop, which I can't remember what the crop was. It wasn't a, 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 an English crop. But the, 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 they showed a little seed like that, and then the seed had kind of a long thread above it, and then the stalk below. So there was a single sort of seed in a long thread. But, but the, the lines of the thread were different, and the color of the seed was slightly different. So they put them in a line across the, <laughs> across the painting. And so you had, you literally had, say, you know, you could say, this is the diversity that you're seeing. So if you're thinking of a land race, um, land races of, say, for example, I don't know, barley. Let's go with barley. So they're going to have different length of horns sticking on them. They're going to be different heights. So how do you show different heights without having to paint the whole ruddy plant? Well, you just arrange them slightly higher and slightly lower and just show the, the top bit. You know, because you've got to keep it, you've got to keep it interesting for your non-technical audience as well do you know i mean obviously the botanical artists will be going oh look how they've done that but i mean a, a normal person will be just going oh okay i see what they mean you know i can see that they're all different i can see why 
they're showing me that, you know. So if, you, if you're talking about, say, um, do you remember I talked about the crook beamed buildings? So if you're talking about that and your thing is to draw trees, you're going to draw a tree that really clearly shows that angle on a branch, aren't you? So that you can then imagine that becoming the beam in the building. You know, you, you, you're you wanting to um, have clue references, if you like, in the way that you produce your image as to what your story is with it. So I mean, I'm, I'm imagine say say you're doing flask which uh, um, flax which Dan you mentioned that comes from the stalk is that right? So how do you do? This is the, the problem. How do you paint stalks? How do you draw stalks and make them interesting and say they're going to be the that's going to be the the textile the the thing that's your challenge as an artist is how do I how do I draw beige straw? stalks and say yeah but it's a really good tea towel or really good top or whatever you know and it's similarly you know in a, a similar thing in terms of material is um uh nettle nettle makes good cloth and so that's a similar issue is is how do you then paint nettles to show the bit that matters for making the cloth do you, do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Are we all happy with that? It's just, it's it's mm -hmm. to try and um, also, I think, to stretch you as an artist, to make you think the choice of it should, should be stretching you, should be making you think. I mean, in the end, you do what plant you can get hold of. But, <laughs> but the actual initial thought process of what could I do, what could I think, is really good in terms of how you think about what artwork that you produce and how you go about producing them. People asked us um, about putting in the, the object that is made from the item. Mm. Um, I I would hesitate, I would, I would, what's the word, um, something caution? I would be cautious. <laughs> yeah, I would be cautious because um, it's sometimes very difficult to get all your scale bars right and make things look correct I, and so, yeah i would just be very cautious also it doesn't kind of work it's kind of it's also quite obvious um in the sense of um illustrative shall we say so it's like you're illustrating something for a children's book that explains this thing and I would like to think that what we're aiming for is something a little bit more towards the art side of things, in that you're suggesting something, but not hammering someone over the head with it. Do you know? So there's the suggestion of how, because that's um, that's a more technically skilled thing to do. That's a more interesting thing to do. That's a better way of starting a conversation with your audience whoever's viewing your image it also um means that you that, that quite a few people might miss what you're on about yeah because diane and i Good talked talk, about it, didn't we? we talked about that and we talked about getting it into the story yeah i'm i would just be i don't know yeah i mean if for example you picked hops you wouldn't want to put a bottle of beer in there or a pint of beer or something i think that's too as you said martin it's a bit cliched but yeah. i think it's i think you it's, tell it in the story yeah, yeah. i yeah. i would like it i would like i would prefer a story that was hinted at that was suggested that was um there i mean obviously you, it's if people are stuck you've got a hundred words to say well for heaven's sake we use it for beer do you know <laughs> if they don't know you know so to, to make it a bit more straightforward and that give people enough clues if you like in the same way that when you see um uh some of the really obscure fine art works you know nothing to do with time club but fine art stuff and they they have a title that's supposed to help you work out what they're doing in the first place you know often you can't but i mean it's that sort of thing i would i would prefer it that it was more subtle than blatant because that's a much more fun and interesting artistic thing uh, to do, I think. Mm -hmm. um, 
do we have any more questions? Is there anybody who would like to ask the question out loud? No, no, it's all right. We've got plenty of time. But does anyone want to ask the question out loud rather than type it? Um, because now's probably a good time. Uh, Carmen. I had, there were lots of different things that I was drawn to, but I really struggled finding the histories of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, but like the story is kind of 50% of like how important this is, isn't it? I think like, so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, um, no, also, I, mean, I, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Because ordinarily when as artists when we're looking at plants we think oh i want to show people that i you know you go around you wander around you spot it and you think oh that i want to show them just as i've seen that there i want to just go and say look, oh look at it like this i look at it like this so it's yeah. that but with a good story behind it so yeah you can't just um it's not just about you as, as an artist it's about how you interpret something as an artist which i feel is a is another aspect of being an artist is that you're 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 okay you're you're set a challenge and it's a bit like do you know those um sometimes they have these town things where you have to go and they, they've got like a ceramic animal and they've painted it and different artists have painted it have you ever seen them and there's like mm -hmm. a thing where you go around the thing and different people have interpreted how they decorate this thing in a different way. So it's kind of that, but not as easy. <laughs> and, yeah. so, and so I know, but I, I, I also think it's really um, important as a botanical artist that we, that, that we have that other level of being able to do that research into the plant material, into what story we can tell. Now, again, this is back to maybe, maybe it's, the story we tell is quite shallow in the end rather than a very deep story it doesn't matter i think it's really important that the we make the effort you know and we make the effort to think about um why we're doing it rather than just entering a pretty picture in a mm. thing, hoping someone's going to buy it you know because if you, yeah. um, because because there's only this one and it's only every five years so why not you know why not use it to challenge yourself um yeah yeah it's, it's just it's finding the histories isn't it? it it is but for example if you're stuck on anything in particular and you you, you found something or you wanted to do it, send us in an email you know yeah. and, and we'll help where we can you know because Sometimes it's easier uh, for um, uh, for someone like me to be able to go and just have a quick internet search because I know what counts as kosher and what what, what doesn't. Um, and also, um, sometimes some of the things where you get folklore associated with plants are quite lightweight, you know. And you say, oh, you know, come yeah. on, that's that's a bit, you know. Um, but but there are still really good strong stories i think associated with things that and you're also looking for something that makes people go oh i didn't know that mm. because that's a fun thing to do isn't it mm. if anyone's <laughs> near it be, they've got they've got cabbages the wild cabbage on their cliffs you know and that's a great story because that's that's the cabbage that all the other cabbages are sort of derived from type thing so you know, it's it's a great story. Or, for example, another good one is um, uh, ba, 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 which I am going to forget. Scurvy grass. So English scurvy grass, which is a little tiny plant like this with little, little green leaves and little white flowers. Scurvy grass. So we use it to treat scurvy. Scurvy is like a vitamin C that the sailors would get. You often find scurvy. Well, you do find scurvy grass on the seaside. You know, so it's a great connection. And a great thing. The the things are that it's quite um it's quite a, what what we would call a low level plant. So you'd have to you'd have to work quite hard as an artist to make it look exciting. But we've also got to think about it maintaining genetic diversity. Well, I know, but I think I I was thinking about that genetic diversity. Um and that works really well. This is just a general interpretation. Is that works really well for crops. You know, when we're looking at apples, when we're looking at things like that. But when you're looking at, um, 
wildflowers or, or, or wild plants and you're looking at um, harvesting them, which I think is in the thing, isn't it? Um, uh, what have we got? Heritage, wild relatives. So ancient, those crops that have been cultivated for hundreds or thousands of years in the same form, and we've got things like wild nettle. Well, there is some variation, genetic variation between wild nettle, but you'd be hard pushed to get around sufficiently different areas of the country in order to draw it and for it to matter in terms of the thing. Do you see what I mean? So that I, I found difficult to interpret in terms of the genetics. But there's woad and, and things like that that, but, although we now commercially produce them, it may come a time when we can't make the stuff synthetically and we might have to go back to the beginning. And that's the whole point of keeping all these but things. But the, the woad thing is not to do with the genetics within the woad plant in the same way that we're thinking of the genetics within the apple. No, this is to go back it's to... It's just a, a more varied thing is how we use different genetic resources in our area. So that's why I think the scurvy grass works. Yeah. Um, or um, mm. uh, woad works in terms of an image you know, of, of, of something to do. Um, and, and for example, there's things like, uh, I thought sea kale was a good one. Sea kale is visually very exciting uh, for those who do. Rhubarb, there's some amazing paintings of rhubarb. I don't know if you've seen uh -huh. some of them where they have the big chunk of root and then the things sprouting out, which is just amazing. So, but I mean, there's lots of different varieties of rhubarb. So, you know, that's it. Sorry, I'm, I'm sidetracking. And you could you could probably approach the RHS or when you're talking about rhubarb, you get all those growers, don't you? The, the well, Yorkshire the RHS triangle. do yeah. have um, the, the national collection of rhubarb. Mm. Um, and I don't know whether they've moved it. It used to be at Wisley, but I don't know whether they've moved it recently to Harrogate or not. Mm. They've, they've moved it to RHS Bridgewater near Bridgewater Manchester. There, um, that's that's my plan to paint for this. So I've been that there visit. and visited a few times. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> exciting. Yeah, so I've got some photos of the forced rhubarb as well at the moment. So yeah, that's, Again, you see, that's, that's really interesting. So rhubarb, we all know rhubarb. So for you, the challenge is how do you show people either a different view of rhubarb, you know, yeah. or a particular thing that you're trying to show? So are you trying well, to the colour? Yeah, I'm wondering if I'm allowed to paint it with a dark background because of the, the amazing forced rhubarb that I've got oh, images you of. Paint that, that, that bright green at the top, you mean? So you've got, you've yeah. got like a lovely deep red stem, haven't you? Or pinky red stem. And then a... Mm -hmm. a an almost fluorescent green is yeah. the leaf coming up. Yeah. And yeah, really sticking that on a, on a black background would work. I mean, I'm, uh, we're okay with that, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, there's nothing to stop you having a black background because... Oh, that's good. I was going to email to ask that anyway, but that's answered that one for I me. Think, Thank yeah, you. The, so I, wouldn't you agree, Diane? Sorry. Yeah, I'm, yeah. That, would, that would be stunning. And, and I, nothing to, to say that you can't. Yeah. Oh, I, I, and, and, and again, if you think about that in terms of how it works in an exhibition, then visually that's a, that's a really arresting image. So, yeah. good one. Like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, you obviously your, your, your rhubarb still has to be accurate and all the rest of it. You know, <laughs> it's, it's still going to be a really, good, a really good image of rhubarb as well, you know, but. Uh, but I, I think a really a really interesting idea. Yeah. Really I don't wonderful. know we've talked there, we've talked about that in terms of colour, but there there's got to be people who I'm sure who do pen and ink or who do um other media uh where there's a way of doing um an image that shows off the best of that media, you know, and how, how you show that. I always like to see, um can't do it, but I do like to see um some of the prints that people do like a lino print and things like that just because it's kind of they're taking a simplified I essence don't remember whether we've said prints are acceptable uh, like that okay. oh, I can't let's, let's just can we cut that out of the recording um, <laughs> no i'm just going to double check and go through the um i, I just i it, you i 
I don't know about other artists, but I always like things that I can't do myself. Do you know, I always particularly find them exciting. I don't want to know how they're done. I want them to be magical and mystical. And I don't know, you know, I, I just want to be able to admire and, uh, and know. And, and, and Prince is one of those things because it simplifies things. And I find simplifying things very difficult. Um, and, you know, I'm all there in the, as many botanical artists are, all there in the complexity. And look at this tiny little detail here. Um, we, we don't actually specifically say, Kind of like I think it's all got to be two D media. We though. say watercolor, colored pencil, graphite, acrylic, pen and ink, acrylic ink, gouache, or a combination of these. Acrylic. So your watercolor would come under, and, and gouache that would work. No photographs or three D artwork. Are we allowed charcoal? Oh, Martin. pencil charcoal. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, charcoal comes under the graphite, doesn't it? It's still yeah, part yeah, of it. Yeah, graphite, yeah. 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 Um, hey, what's this, Julia? Interestingly, we don't... <laughs> I agree, say... Julia. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Sorry. We we haven't said anything about silver point. I can't do it. Have we, Diane? What do you reckon? Um, yeah. um, we do have a few artists that use silver point. Yes, we do. Um we I mean, put it on here specifically. From the point of view of looking at um, an image made from silver point, it's not too different from from graphite. Oh. You know, so I would I would pretty much treat it similarly. I remember with the first exhibition that we did of this, um, I, I was very much fooled by someone who'd done something in pencil, which I thought was was painted, and uh, I was doing a tour and I was chatting about this. And I chatted very, very knowledgeably about this painting. And the lady who actually did the thing said, actually, it's pencil. <laughs> and so it's like, OK, recover yourself, Martin. You know, what are you going to say now? It's like, well, it's very did good. <laughs> did we put colour pencil down? Because that yeah. would be acceptable. Again, colour pencil, I think. No, should... we have put colour pencil, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I, uh, that, that whole range of, of, of ways of looking and ways of having, I think, is a good thing to have. Yeah. Right. Can I just ask anybody else? Who who else has a question they would like to ask? Anybody? Oh, hang on. Can I just check? Can you submit two pieces? Yes. For the British one, you can select two pieces. If you go on and um, check on the website, there are two dimensions, but yes, you can submit two original entries there's an entry fee of 22 pounds which will apply for each submission is that all right yeah that's, that's a common yes good good okay go go and check the criteria carmen are you submitting in in, in the uk yes yes i am yeah go, go and check because there's lots of things and make sure that you know the two outside mount dimensions yeah yeah no i definitely got the sizes i just when i looked again i couldn't find the bit that i thought it, i read that you could put two in but then i couldn't find it again no that's fine you can put two pieces in you have to pay 22 pounds for each and that's sort of admin fees and um we've got to hire the gallery and stuff yeah yeah thank you you're welcome and the ideas well, behind something having about the gallery and the other things that we're planning. Yeah, I was just going to say the the reason for the stories is about the uh, catalogue stroke book or catabook. I wanted to call it a catabook. It's a catabook. <laughs> I even told um, Shirley Sherwood it was a catabook. <laughs> um, yes, the gallery. Did you want to talk about no, the, the, the catabook thing? Been... No, just talking on that was that our idea was that we would be able to put together a really interesting catalog that was a little bit more than, you know, a little bit more information. And having that short hundred words with the image helps illuminate and give a story to the image, which I think is very useful as an artist to have and very useful to think about as well. But I'm gonna hand over to Diane to talk about where we're going. Oh yes, so, um... We've got a beautiful gallery in Birmingham in the old jewellery quarter. It's the Royal Birmingham Art Society's gallery. Um, 
we will have um, the pieces on display there. And we're also hoping, I believe, to have a, a sort of a video installation as well so that we can show it um, up there. And we can also give it to other societies so that they can show it on the actual day, which is the 18th of May, uh, 2025. Um, so we will obviously be organizing all the framing ourselves. So there is a consistency of framing and size of the paintings. But the gallery is a really lovely space. Um, and I think the artwork would look very good there. Um, we're, we're of, I can't remember exactly. We're going to have 60 paintings there, but 40 selected for the actual ASBA exhibition as well. Um, so we'll have plenty of space there for, for the artwork. Yeah. So yes, yeah. So the, 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 the actual jury selected um, exhibition as such is 40 images. Uh, and then there's, we can add in another 20 at that thing. Because, we, you know, you want to show as much of people's work as you can. Um, and, uh, anybody who puts their work in, mm -hmm. everybody, and this is the ABBA policy, will be shown online in the ABBA gallery. Mm -hmm. So we will show everybody that submits work, unless it is not botanical art or doesn't meet the criteria for the exhibition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. it's yeah. one of the things that we've we've done a lot of is to make sure that uh, one of the things that you learn as a, as an artist is seeing your work against or with or next to other artists, and you can learn a lot by seeing yours literally in a different way with other people against those things. And so that's a a, a policy that we've always had at ABBA is that um, whatever the standard, it, it should go into the exhibition when we're having ABBA our own exhibitions. And what we wanted to do with this is just to say to those people um, who didn't get selected to the jury, because we're imagining it's um, going to be quite, um, well, that's, that's, the standards are getting higher and higher with botanical art and people are producing better and better work. And so it gets harder and harder to get stuff into um, a juried exhibition. So we wanted to make sure that everyone can then see their own work against all the other works. And I think and that's what, a nice it, idea. It's what ABBA does, and it's what we believe with well, the whole purpose of setting ABBA up was to create a, an a exhibition space or an artist space where we can all come together and we're not judged on portfolio work we've done before. It means that there is a stepping stone between going to starting lessons and joining another professional body. Oh. It gives you that step, which was missing. And um, I think the nice opportunity as well about the exhibition is you will be able to have the work for sale. Um, the gallery takes a small commission. I think it's 10% plus VAT. Um, is that all they take? Yes, but yeah. unless, unless they sell it after the exhibition from the catalogue and then it's more. But oh, I think that's that, yeah, 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 because of handling fees. Yeah. So there is a, a nice opportunity to to sell your yeah. work with without a massive commission on it. Um, and we but... did sell work at the first mm. exhibition. It did actually sell quite well. I remember the Babington's Leak, a Mali blesser. Um, Mali Francis did the Babington's Leak, and that sold to Shelley oh, Shelley, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. Good. That was a lovely pink painting. It yeah. was a fantastic painting. Yeah. Bless her. Anyway, yes, sorry. So we might have, well, but we don't quite know how we'll organise it exactly yet in um, Birmingham, but we will, we have, there is space for 60 pieces. Mm -hmm. um, whether there's space for more, we don't know. But we will do those details later. But this is a, this one is about you know, selecting. Anybody else got any questions? Because I'm realizing it's 2051. Anybody else? Have we covered everything? I or don't... just all like, oh no, too much information now. <laughs> well, it may be that people will go away and they'll think. I think so, yeah. If, Actually, if I think this is what I'm going to choose. Is it right? Email yeah. in. If you're stuck on something, email. do send us in just an email. And we will us. try and answer it fairly promptly. And I will think as well, Sarah, you would uh, talk about your rhubarb. Um, if you've actually got a variety name to that rhubarb, 
of the images that you've got or can find it out that's a helpful thing yes yeah it so in the ways in which you're looking at what you can do it's great if it's rhubarb and it's a really good image it's better if it's rhubarb and it's got a variety name and whatever it is that's a, a, yeah you know, it's, it's in a, you know not, not to put you off if you've got the stuff and you haven't got the the name of the you know the variety of the rhubarb but mm -hmm. you know it's, it's just one of those things it's like um because there are lots of varieties it's a helpful thing to have that on your thing and it's a good practice thing as well as an artist as a botanical artist yeah yeah, yeah as... i'm trying to make sure it's not one of the commercially grown ones and it's more of a heritage type one yeah but i mean i mean they're yeah. not they're not commercially grown in a massive scale no obviously. so i mean it's not it's not hugely of, of an issue but you know okay you know no, just... but you still need to choose one that isn't one that's chosen for small mass production <laughs> Oh, do you? Is that a thing as well? Well, I think so, because what you're looking at is what's heritage, what's what's a variety that isn't now chosen to be grown across the fields? I mean, I like, well, because there's the rhubarb triangle, isn't there, where they have yeah. the... And I don't know what variety they use in them. I've no, not, but they would know... The they would, they would know where Sarah's working, wouldn't they? Yeah. Yes, hopefully. I'm I'm trying to get in contact with the um rhubarb guru at at Bridgewater, but uh, he's he's a bit elusive. So once I've once I've made contact with him, I'll know which ones are the commercial oh, ones and which are they, they are that's that's a good source. The person uh, uh, Alexandra, you asked about books. Yeah. Um, that's a good thing to do is to look for the people that are growing the things. Mm -hmm. So go to the Hop Growers Institute, go to and ask them. There's there's even one for green gauges. A green gauge is a nice one. It's not a hugely commercialized prop. I don't think it's are, commercialized at all, is it? No, well, there are people, they used to be, used to be able to grow, grow no, by green. Just, yeah. But there are people in Kent who specialise in green gauges. Hmm. So find out from them. I mean, if you can go directly to people, people who yeah, grow... I mean, do, do bear in mind that experts on anything are so excited when someone comes to actually ask them about their experts. Yeah. Especially, and I'm going to say this in all understanding, especially if they're men, because people often don't talk to them about their specialist subject. And so if you show the slightest bit of interest- oh, That's to... very general. It's very sexist, it's very general. It's also accurate. Uh, it might be in your- I mean, I think I think the person who's growing your stuff then, Elaine. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, and I think as well, if someone is an expert, I mean, it's the sort of thing with gooseberries or with something like that, you know, they're, they're going to be an enthusiast. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. You. Well, it's five minutes. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Good. The next, um, the next, uh, Q&A we were going to do was going to look at the two size dimensions and help support people who may be a little unsure about how to set their image within the two sizes and that's on the 16th of April at 8 p.m. Yeah and also for that for that one if you're wanting to come along to that one if you have an idea of um what plant you're wanting to do then we can talk composition. Yeah, we can talk any, anything. You know, we can discuss ideas and we can discuss, you know, the sort of thing that might show off what you want to show off about that plant and how you would go about it. And how you or, or if you've got a sketch and you want to know whether that works. We did that once with, yeah, we did a good one with the, um, on previous exhibitions we've had someone just <laughs> hold up a sketch. Yeah, yeah, I mean, just a rough sketch thing. This is what I'm thinking of. Does it work? You know? And that's a good way of doing it and um, thinking about it is thinking thinking about it by showing someone and that 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 um, 
the act of showing people what you're thinking makes you think again and wonder about their reactions and think again, which which I think again is helpful as a as an artist, especially. Doesn't doesn't artists. mean we're necessarily right, but you know. no, no, no. But <laughs> because it's in the end, you all in the end, you're going to choose what you want to choose yourself. Yeah, and it's also other people in the audience chipping in. Yeah. I think I think that can be quite nice and quite quite a nice thing to have. Before I close, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming and for your in, it, real interest in botanical art worldwide. This is an amazing thing to do. Um, it will be a really good exhibition and there is going to be um, something hosting in the um, Shirley Sherwood Gallery, actually in the Marion North section of the Shirley Sherwood Gallery on the 18th of May 2025. There are some people from um, the steering committee or the wider uh, groups that we're associated with who are going to be demonstrating. Um, and the images that get chosen, the 40, will be on the big um, BAWW 2025 worldwide video. So what we, the, we choose our 40, they get sent to America, they get linked up with the 40s from every other country and you get this huge, well, it's it's a PowerPoint, but video, and then that is displayed. And that so if you do get through, your work will be shown in the Marion North on the 18th of May, which is really useful. So thank you, Diane, for coming, and thank you, Martin. And thank you all, because without you, this wouldn't happen. <laughs>